strange new world. Oh, thank you, whoever is starting the recording. I appreciate that. I, I forgot. Um, so before COVID hit, we were seeing a lot of, of the, the gen, Gen Y and Gen Z, the millennials and the Gen Zers were really starting to talk about they wanted more flexibility in their work for in their work environment. And so we were kind of seeing this movement uh, and more demand for this before COVID. And then of course COVID hit and all of us all wound up, or many of us wound up working either remotely or in a hybrid situation. And then now as we're starting to come out of it, obviously we're still working through this hybrid and remote situation. So things have changed a lot. Um, and, and we've also seen as a result of it, this unprecedented employee movement. So people are quitting their positions and taking new positions at a rate that we've never seen before. And, and this creates lots and lots of opportunities. And it creates lots of, of sort of the ability to, to, to create and dictate what you want in a work environment. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the next few years. If this continues, if this sort of starts moving back towards a more uh, traditional model, right now, Currently, the, the employee has a lot of power and weight in this whole process. The, the ability to negotiate things that oftentimes weren't negotiable before. And things like working remotely, hybrid schedule, um, more working to get the job done um, and not so much dictated by a st uh, strict Monday through Friday, eight to five. So we're seeing some of that, but we're also right now seeing some inflation and economic changes that, that could slow down hiring in the next few years, depending on what happens with all of this, in which case maybe it starts balancing things a little bit. Um, so it can, it's, it's really a time of change right now. And change brings opportunities, but ch change can also for a lot of people bring stress. And so um, this is something that, that each of us, when we're doing our career planning and thinking about what's next, we need to be thinking about these things also. I love right now this ability for people to create their own work environment. And really, you know, we haven't seen this before. It's pretty much been, you know, the job is Monday through Friday, eight to five, maybe more hours than that, probably not less. Um, but right now we're seeing this ability that, that you can say, you know, I really want a, uh, an opportunity to work remotely. And, or I want I want to be in an office, or I want to have some blend of the two. I want to be able to work anywhere, you know, as long as I have my laptop with me and I can get the work done. It doesn't matter if I'm in the Bahamas or if I'm if I'm here in Kansas City. And so um, the the opportunities are are out there for us really to create the work environment that fits us and our lifestyle the best. Now, it's not always possible that you were, you're going to have all of these opportunities with every company, though. It is important that you do your research on companies so that you have an understanding. A lot of companies are saying, we're going 100% back in the office. So that's going to be difficult. If what you want is remote or a lot of flexibility, that type of company probably isn't going to be as willing to, to negotiate those with you. So while there are tons of opportunities to create the, the, the job and the career and the work environment of your choice, um, you do still need to understand that that, that might not be possible with every organization. And so really do your research and find, if you want that flexibility, find those companies that are really open to it. And there are many, many, many more of those companies now than there used to be. And you can find this oftentimes, you can find it in their, um, you know, right in the job description. They'll talk about, you know, this job can be remote or we're, we're an in-office environment. Um, oftentimes you can find some of this information on their website. You might want to do some research on LinkedIn. Sometimes companies will put out articles about they're really proud of the fact that they're offering all of their employees this flexibility. So um, if, if 
these things are important to you, make sure you're doing your research to find out what companies are going to be able to accommodate the things that are most important to you. And sometimes you do need to compromise a little bit, especially in the short term. A lot of companies will say, you know, for the first six months, we really want you to be in the office, at least on a hybrid basis. And, and this really gives them a chance to, to provide that training uh, and that onboarding experience for you um, before setting you off um, in a completely remote environment. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to really show and prove yourself that, that you, you can produce and that you can be effective in whatever environment. Um, so, so sometimes be willing to, to negotiate in the short term to get what you want in the long term. Um, and, um, and but I'd say be upfront with, with what your hopes and expectations are, because obviously you don't want to, to compromise and say, oh yeah, I'll work in the office Monday through Friday with a company and, and thinking in the back of your mind, but you know, six months from a year from now, I want to be fully remote if the company's policy isn't, isn't for remote work. So um, again, it's really based on doing the research. So, so once you've decided the type of company that you want and perhaps the, the type of work style that you're looking for, you know, now it's time to, to get your application materials ready and to apply for that position. And, and you're going to butt up against applicant tracking systems, whether you know it or not. Almost everybody uses these these days. And, um, and so it's important to know what they are and then how to be most effective using them. So what they are is uh, it's basically a software program and platform that companies use to, they'll use it to post the position, to track who applies for it, and then to select candidates. And then they usually use these applicant tracking systems for a lot of the back end HR. So, you know, the processing of people moving from first uh, interview to second and then offers and all of that. So, but the, the part that's that's tricky for the applicant is the, the, the part where you upload your resume and fill out that application. And most companies are using, it's a, a sort of not terribly smart AI um, and and it's looking for keywords, it's looking for key phrases, it's looking for certain attributes within your, your resume and your application that you know, everybody makes you fill out endlessly, that long process. Um, and so you wanna make sure that, that you're, you're being smart about uh, using the right words and, and phrases to make sure that you get through the applicant tracking system. So let's let's look a little bit more at what, what is all involved in this. And the, the phrase that I like to tell people is you need to connect the dots. Because if you're looking at working with a computer program, and, and that's what most of it is, is that they're not gonna be able to look at your resume and say, well, you've got this experience over here in A, and our job is over here at X, and so I can see that there's some similarities. You really need to be able to connect the dots. You need to be talking about how your past and your work experience makes you specifically able, capable, and the right candidate for the job that they're posting. So you start have to start thinking about your resume, not as a history document, not as a, here is what I've done, here are the tasks that I have been involved in in the past, but picking out those things that you've done in your previous work experience that just really directly address those items in the job description that they're looking for. So you might be in a job currently that, and I'm always really bad at coming up with examples on the spot, but um, but you might be working and and doing some things, and you know maybe you're working on proposals in a nonprofit industry, and and working on um, you know maybe grants and things like that, and maybe you're applying for a job that's working with RFPs, which is a request for proposal or uh, RFIs, request for information in a really corporate setting. 
So if you use too much of the jargon and too much of the, um, the language that you use in this nonprofit setting and talking about grants, it's not necessarily going to get you through the applicant tracking system for this, this RFP job. And yet, grant writing and, and filling out RFPs are very, very similar jobs. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're talking about your work experience that you've had in terms that are appropriate for the job that you're applying for so that you get through this applicant tracking system. Because what happens is the applicant tracking system gives you a score and it'll score you on like what percentage of these keywords you have on your resume and do you have the right education and, and um, specific phrases. Um, it also is going to score you on grammar and and punctuation so you if you have some of those mistakes it docks your score um, and what happens is especially for competitive jobs on a scale of 100 they really want you to have a minimum of an 80 percent match to the job and and anything below that oftentimes you never even get looked at by a human being so it just it immediately gets rid of you and you're out of the running so you need to do what you can to, to get as high a score through these applicant tracking systems as you possibly can. And the other thing to think about is that many of these applicant tracking systems, and I know this is true for UMKC also, but many of them look at an incomplete application. So oftentimes I think if you build out these online applications, they're so long and boring. And you, you say, you know, I just uploaded my resume. So so I'm not going to bother cutting and pasting, you know, for each of these jobs in my job history. I don't want to cut and paste everything into that box um, because they can just look at, uh, look at it on my resume. But some of these applicant tracking systems are set so that any blank box, any empty box is considered an incomplete application. And again, it just, it's, it's eliminated. So in order to make sure that you're the best candidate, at least put something into those boxes so that it at least it comes through as a, a complete application. And the other thing to think about, I know a lot of us want to create a really visually attractive resume with the idea that it will make us stand out. So maybe you're using colors and color blocks, maybe you're using some infographics. The challenge is that the applicant tracking systems, again, not really all that bright. And so they get confused by this formatting. And oftentimes that in itself will give you a lower score. So it can be really challenging to get a good score if you're using some of those graphic elements. Things you might want to consider. In this, we have um, Patsy's resume on the on the left hand side and um and this is really the format that that's going to go through the applicant tracking systems the best nice and clean no graphic elements except for the bullets um and and so the, this is really what the applicant tracking systems are set up to read optimally. So best to take out all of those fancier features and really go with just this nice clean format. The other advantage of this is that it really allows you to get a lot more content, a lot more of those keywords in, because you're not taking up space with these sidebars and all of this, which really gives you very little space to actually put content in. So stay away from the colors, definitely stay away from the photo, the little graphic elements, not going to help you. Um, and, and really just stick with nice, clean format. And while we're talking about resumes, Again, I, I have to recommend going with that nice basic format. It'll never, it'll never get you in trouble, um, especially if you're applying electronically through a company's website. Um, try and keep it to one to two pages. The general rule of thumb is you can move to two pages once you've been in your profession for about five to seven years. It's not set in stone or anything. 
um, sometimes people who have been with one company and maybe maybe one dominant role within a company um, for, for a decade or so, you probably don't need to move to that second page. Um, whereas if maybe you've moved around every few years, it, you would move to uh, a second page a little earlier. But, um, but try not to go more than two pages. It's rarely necessary. And we always tell people no objective statements anymore. Your objective is to get the job that you're applying for. So there's, there's really no point in that objective statement. But it might be interesting for you to have what's called a professional summary. And in that summary, again, it's not a history. It's this right at the top, prime real estate on your resume. This, this ability to summarize how your past work experience makes you perfectly qualified for this job. I'm going to back up and we're going to look at Patsy's resume as an example. So if Patsy was applying for a job, say, as a, an experienced finance manager in a corporate environment, and then this would be a good professional summary. And, and I always tell people, if the job description says we're looking for somebody with eight to 12 years of experience, um, regardless of how much experience you, you know, maybe you have 30 years of experience, but, but put at the top, management professional with eight plus years of experience. So, so you're highlighting right there that you have the experience that they're looking for. And again, this is an important thing with the applicant tracking systems because they are looking for eight to 12 years of experience. If you say 30, it's not going to compute. So, um, so, so really make sure that you're showing that you meet the qualifications of the job. So, and again, you'd wanna talk about those things in your past that are directly related to the job that you want. So assuming that the Patsy here is applying for a job where in the job description, they're talking about financial planning, reporting and controls, short and long-term business strategy. She's saying right there at the very top of her resume that that's what she's got experience in. So sure, it might be somewhere in the resume, but she's just really highlighting what a good fit she is right at the top. So if you're going to use a professional summary, it needs to be hyper tailored to the job that you're applying to, to each and every job that you apply to. Um, and, but it can be a really, really effective way of, of highlighting that you're a great fit. And then details and quantify. There's so many times that we see resumes, even from really experienced people, where they do this sort of very generic, um, almost listing of tasks, rather than talking about the, the value or the outcomes associated with those tasks. So quantify anything you can quantify, um, give some details. It's okay if those bulleted lines are a couple lines long. It doesn't mean you, there's nothing to say. And people always mention this like, oh, I thought I, I couldn't go down to a second line. If you need to, you need to. So tell that, that story with some detail. Um, again, follow make sure it's keyword rich. And one of the things that I always like people to, to give a try is this, this website called jobscan.co. And this can really help you figure out what the keywords are and how you're doing. So what happens is you, you log in, you can upload your resume and then cut and paste the job description and hit scan. And it'll tell you, it reverse engineers that applicant tracking system and it'll tell you how good a match you are, what kind of score you would get, and then it actually will tell you what are the words and phrases that you need to add to your resume in order to, to put your get your score to go up. I love this tool. I will tell you, it's depressing the first time you use it because you upload your resume and you think, I'm a perfect fit for this job, and then, and then you get a score of 20. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're not a good fit for the job. It means your resume isn't well tailored to that job. So, so don't get disheartened and think, 
I'm, I'm not a good fit. This isn't the right job for me. It could still be the greatest job in the world for you. You just need to do a little bit better job of selling yourself on your resume. But job scan will actually tell you, show you, you know, if you add these words that it's suggesting, you can see your score going up and up and up. And it's kind of fun to do it. It'll take a lot of time the first time you use it. But then after that, you'll probably find you're just tweaking your resume for one job or another. And so it'll be a much faster process and well worth the time. Um, because, you know, if you're going through and applying for a ton of jobs, but you're not doing that tailoring, the chances of actually getting through the applicant tracking system is so slim. So it's a better proposition, actually, to apply for fewer positions, do more tailoring, and, and probably have better outcomes as a result. Of course, we always say no photos, no personal information. Um, a lot of times people will want to include a photo. And it's true that anybody who's interested in you can just go to LinkedIn and see your photo there, but, but don't put it on your resume. There's a lot of companies, um, especially larger companies that have a just, it's a policy. You put a photo on it and, you, and you've disqualified yourself. You're, you know, they're so concerned that, that that there might be some sort of indication of a preference based on on your appearance um, that that they don't want to go there. And so their policy is that we just eliminate all resumes that have a photo on them. So just don't include it. It's not necessary. And no personal information. I, I know if we've got anybody who's done a job search, say in Europe, it's really common to put on your resume that you're married and you have children and, and things like that. And we do not do that here in the US at all, ever. Um, so no personal information like that. Your job, your resume should really just be focused on your professional history. And so I mentioned that you need to add some detail. And I, I just, I love to recommend to everybody to scope out this article by Laszlo Bach. So Laszlo Bach here is um, the former chief human resources officer at Google. And a few years ago, he wrote this really wonderful, pretty short article. Um, and we'll give the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation to you, and it's hyperlinked in here, um, where you can access this, or you can just look it up on, uh, do a Google search. It's been, it was posted originally in LinkedIn, but it's been reposted all over the place because it's a fantastic article. And his winning formula for how to give detail for those bulleted descriptions of the work that you've done is accomplished X as measured by Y by doing C. And so if you think of you know, writing those bulleted items in this general format, that you'll just automatically be forced to give some nice detail. And so, you know, he gives the example, and in his article, he has lots and lots of examples, which is one of the reasons why I love it. Um, but he gives the example. So you might write something like achieved annual business plan commitments for volumes, model nets, wholesale revenue, selling expenses, and brand. And you might think, that's pretty good. That's pretty detailed. And yet, if I don't know what your business plan commitments are, I don't understand some of the, this verbiage and lingo. It doesn't mean that much to me. I don't know if you if you achieved this barely by the skin of your teeth. I don't know if you were a superstar. So if you can quantify, if you can get a little bit more detail in there, then, then it's just going to be that much more impactful for the reader of this. So if you say you contributed a to a 21% increase by achieving 158% of your target. Um, now, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm starting to visualize what it means when you say you achieved your business plan. So, so think about how you can add those details. Now, not every one of your bulleted points is probably going to be quite this rich in detail. I mean, seriously, it's tough to write them. But I'd say for each one of your jobs, you need to have at least one of these, like super rich, and preferably two of these bullets that you've dedicated should be these super rich, really detailed type of uh, examples. 
And and I'm, I'm not going to lie, this is the toughest part of writing a good resume, but this is the detail that's going to make a big difference in getting through something like an applicant tracking system. And this is the detail that once your resume gets in front of a hiring manager, that they're going to think, oh, wow, this is a good resume. So, so this is, again, something where it's a little more important to invest the time doing this level of detail um, rather than just sending out the same generic resume over and over and over again. All right, so we'll wrap up here with networking because because you know what? The thing of it is, all of this thing that we're talking about with applicant tracking systems is not nearly as important if you do your networking. The the you know really optimizing your resume is is vitally important if you're just applying blindly to a position because you need to to get through the applicant tracking system however if you do some networking and you've met with somebody and they call the hiring manager and say hey i just talked to this really interesting person i i think you you know they might be great for the position you should take a look at them then they'll pull your resume out of that that pile regardless of what your score was and take a look at it as, as a human being putting eyeballs on it. So the power of networking is, is so huge and makes such a huge difference in this process um, that, that I always recommend to people spend 75% of your time networking and spend 25% of your time actually applying for jobs and, and you'll, you'll get the job that you want faster. So. What do, what do I mean by, by networking and how to get started? Of course, I love LinkedIn. I mean, I love LinkedIn. I think it's a fantastic tool for networking. And, and so if you're new to networking or if you're a little rusty or if you're really, really great at networking, I would regardless, I would say get on LinkedIn, make sure you have a profile created and then start looking for people. I think that alumni, fellow alumni of UMKC are always a great first place to start because you have that one connection already. It's a little easier to reach out to them if you're feeling a little uncomfortable about it. So um, there is a really wonderful tool in uh, LinkedIn where you can go to the UMKC page on LinkedIn, and then it's got a little button that says alumni. And on that button, then it will take you and you can start doing a sort like, I'm looking for alumni who live in Kansas City, who majored in engineer, mechanical engineering, who work at Black and & Beach. And, and then it'll show you all of those alumni. And then you can start looking at those and think, ah, you know, this person seems to have something similar, or this is person is in a role that I'm hoping to get. Um, and so you can just reach out to them, start that conversation. And really that conversation is always about them. And I think this is one of the things that makes people nervous about networking is that you feel like you're reaching out to people and asking for a favor or you know, trying to sell them on you. Um, but really I'd say approach networking as just being curious and, and curious about that other person, their work, their company. And so these whole conversations shouldn't be, I wanna get a job with your company, but can you tell me a little bit about what you do at the company? What's the culture like there? What do you like about working there? How did you, you know, what has your career progression looked like? What advice would you give? So, so it's really about them. And, and, and there's all sorts of studies that show that if you're, if you're chatting with, if two people are chatting, the person who does the most talking is the person who walks away thinking that was a great conversation. So your goal is to get them chatting and people like to talk about themselves. So, um, so ask them questions about, about their profession, about their career path, about the company, about the industry. You will get tons and tons of good information that you can use. 
And they'll start, they'll walk away thinking, oh, well, that was just a really nice person I talked to. Um, and then and then you don't need to ask them for a job at that point. Um, but maybe when you see a job posted, say this person worked at Black and Beach, and you now see that there's a position that's open that you're really interested in, you can circle back to that person and say, you know, I really was so impressed with everything that you had to say about Black and Beach and what the culture is like there. I just found this position I'm really interested in. Would you have any tips or suggestions for me that might make me a strong applicant? And hear what they say and try and incorporate it. You're not asking them for a job. You're all just merely asking for some tips, some suggestions, some thoughts. Um, but oftentimes what happens is that person will say, well, why don't you send me your resume? and I will pass it along. Or send me your resume and I'll reach out to human resources and tell them to be looking out for it. Um, and, and that's what you need, is something that pulls you out of that electronic stack of resumes. And so it's, it takes a little bit of time uh, to build those relationships, but, but it can be so worth it. Oftentimes also, um, positions are never even posted. Um, and this is, I think, what really surprises people. The statistic on this is something like 80% of jobs are never even posted. And so you might be having a conversation with somebody that you met through LinkedIn and just a nice conversation about what they do. And they might be thinking in the back of their head, oh, we were just thinking we needed to add a new team member. I wonder if this person would be good for that. And then they, they start that conversation to talk about a position that has never yet been posted. And so rather than going through the whole process of you know, posting a position, sifting through hundreds of resumes, hours and hours of interviews, they just decide they like you and you'd be a good fit and they offer it to you. So, so it can also be a really great way of discovering positions that were never posted and never will be posted. Other opportunities for networking, I'd say professional associations are always a good thing to belong to. It really shows your commitment to developing within your profession. Uh, it's a great way to learn about different companies and different avenues of your, your stated profession, whether it's marketing or supply chain or engineering. Um, so highly recommended. And oftentimes they'll do social events. Um, more and more of them are doing a lot of virtual events and, and just a good way to get your name out there, meet people and start those conversations with people you already have something in common with. Also start doing some networking within your own organization. Is there a neighboring department that, that might be interesting? Um, or you just are curious about what they do? Start doing that, that internal networking, I think is also a really great way to get started and really a great way to identify opportunities within your company that maybe not aren't that straight line connection, but maybe sort of in a little bit different direction and, and yet might be a really interesting way for you to advance your career. And of course, friends and family, um, social media, I, I've heard so many times where people will say, I, I commented on an article or a posting on Twitter or Instagram or, or LinkedIn, and they wrote back, wrote back to me and, you know, commented about my comments. So it too can be a really great way to start some of those conversations in a really sort of organic um, and not quite so threatening way is just to, to follow those people um, and maybe respond to whatever it is that they're talking about and posting. And then, of course, you know, random conversations. Um, I, I know I one time got an interview because I started a conversation with somebody on an airplane and, and we just had a really good conversation in the course of two hours and I was invited to apply for a position. So you just never know when things will or how things will pop up. So just be willing to, to start those conversations with people. Um, and which of course leads me to my final slide is that the way to get started with your job search, with networking, with any of it is to, to quit talking and begin doing. But I'm going to quit talking now and, and turn it back to you so you can ask some questions. Let me stop sharing my screen. And so what do you think? Questions?
Nothing. Quiet little group. Well, I can just chime in and say thank you for sharing all of that. A lot of good knowledge. And I'm positive uh, a lot of the alums or students who are joining us today have benefited from it. Um, yeah, but thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much, Yusuf. So do you think any of this will be helpful in your own job search or have you have you seen this or just a really quiet group? Well, I'm going to put my contact information in the the chat box. And feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any questions that maybe you don't want to ask of the, with the whole group here, but always happy to, to respond to people. And like I said, I do have some colleagues here from across the university. While I'm in the business school and maybe you're in engineering or healthcare, um, we can always, I can always get you directed to the person that would be most equipped to, to help you out. Maybe I'll just ask a question, maybe a student would ask, um, or an alum would ask as well, uh, what would be the best way to connect with us and, you know, or the career coaches, um, for advice or for help for appointments? Yeah. So, um, for, um, for people, I would say probably the easiest way to find us and connect is just to go to the website. So um, the General Career Center office, your website is careers.umkc.edu. Is that correct? Yeah, and I was referring to also Handshake. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, everybody uh, in, the, in here, aside from the career coaches and the staff, are connected through Handshake or not. Yeah, so Yusuf, that's a great point. So if you've graduated within a year, you still have full access to Handshake. And so to, to access that, it's just umkc.joinhandshake.com. Um, and then for, for those of you who have been out longer than um, one year, you can still access handshake by going to umkc.joinhandshake.com, but you'll probably have to create a profile and then we'll have to go in and approve it um, as an alum, but, but you still have access to it. And you can schedule an appointment with us through there, or you can look for jobs um, there. We have some for more experienced hires on there. We also have a lot of resources. So you, you, we have the link for job scan, but we have a, a wide variety of resources to help people in their job search. And that's available to all of our alumni also. But again, if, if you're like, I don't really wanna bother with creating a handshake profile, I just wanna chat with you. Um, like I said, you can email me directly, you can go to our website, all of our contact information is there. Um, for the, the business careers, it's uh, careers.block.umkc.edu. And again, we have a lot of resources right on our webpage. We're here, Career Services is here for life. So as an alum, you have access to us for, for your entire career, and we'd love to hear from you. We work with a lot of alumni, and, and I, I know for myself, some of those are the really the, the most rewarding uh, interactions and conversations, so we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Goldie. I appreciate that for us. Goldie has put the contact, the website information in the chat. And I believe Ashley had put in the schedule for all of the presentations this week and, and activities. And, um, and again, we love alumni week because we love our alumni. So we, we hope to have a chance to meet you on Thursday evening, late afternoon in person, but, um, but um, we'd also love to see you at any of the other workshops that we're doing this week.
Any other questions? I don't, we have a couple minutes, so I don't want to cut you short, but. I'm not missing anything in the chat. All right. Well, I'll give you the gift of 15 minutes and, and hope to see you later this week. Thanks so much.